Mr. President and colleagues, while the substitute language has changed from the original version of this bill as written, it remains egregious and harmful to voters and adds additional unnecessary cumbersome time-consuming work for clerks and election officials. The updated version of Senate Bill 285 that is before us removes the requirement for a physical copy of ID to be included with an AV ballot application. And instead, it would require an applicant for an AV ballot to provide either a Michigan driver's license number, Michigan personal ID card number, last four digits of your social security number, which we've already heard why is detrimental, or present or attach a copy of your ID for election purposes. Why are we requiring an applicant for an absentee ballot to provide sensitive information with their application, thus potentially opening themselves up to malfeasance from bad actors? Not the clerks, mind you. And while it is an option to provide a photocopy of one's government-issued ID, whether that ID is a driver's license issued under the Michigan Vehicle Code, an official state personal ID card issued under Michigan law, a current driver's license issued by another state, a current state personal ID card issued, um, a, issued, a current U.S. passport or federal government issued photo ID card, a current military photo ID card, a current tribal photo ID card, a current student photo ID card issued by a high school in this state or an accredited institution of higher learning located in this state. Interestingly enough, your voter registration card is not among the things that you can use. This option of providing a copy of one of these forms of government-issued ID creates a de facto poll tax. And that is among the most harmful of the many problematic issues Senate Bill 285 has. Now let me provide some history of poll tax use in this country, which, as we are in the week leading up to Juneteenth, is especially appropriate and a relevant lesson. In the United States, a poll tax is the requirement to pay a fee to vote in an election, and it has a long, sordid history. Poll taxes essentially disenfranchise impoverished and minoritized people, often one in the same. The alternate methods in this bill for proof of identity as an absentee voter do not make up for, compensate, or otherwise negate, or mollify the fact that within this very piece of legislation is languished enshrining into law the ability to allow a poll tax. Now, payment of a poll tax was required in order for a citizen to cast a ballot in federal or state elections. Regulations on poll taxes varied by state and even between or across municipalities within a state. In fact, poll taxes in some form occurred in most states for longer than three centuries. Poll taxes were most egregiously used, however, after the Civil War during Reconstruction and the era of Jim Crow. This is well documented in highly respectable places, such as the Library of Congress. Now stay with me, because this is all relevant, so I hope you're listening. Poll taxes were used so ham-handedly during Reconstruction because in 1870, Congress passed the 15th Amendment. And it reads, let me remind you, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So all of the previously enslaved black men, remember white women, still wouldn't be able to vote for another 50 years, and black women, not for nearly in another entire century, would be able to vote. But black men, just like white men, 
the same white men and their families who held black men and their ancestors and children captor, captive for generations. But there is that poll tax issue that remained. In order to vote, you needed some kind of cash to pay the poll tax. No money, no ability to pay the poll tax, and therefore no ability to vote. One couldn't even be on the voter rolls without a record of having paid the poll tax the preceding year. Now to us, this is a foreign concept because today, except for the elders who were still around during Jim Crow, it is free for us to register to vote, and you only have to register to vote once in your state of permanent residence. Anyone who has ever moved to another state knows this. Anyway, during Reconstruction and Jim Crow's reign of terror, the no cash, no payment of the poll tax, no ability to vote created a problem for newly impoverished, formerly human-owning white men who after the Civil War lost assets of land, crops, human capital of enslaved black people performing free labor. Only those persons exempt from paying the poll tax were those men whose grandfathers were able to vote prior to the establishment of the 15th Amendment. And this, folks, is why it's important to read all the fine print on anything you're going to sign or take an oath on. So how did the authorities know if one's grandfather voted? By the records of the payment of his poll tax in the years with prior elections. So the right to vote even though in text, wasn't simply a condition of citizenship, non-servitude, and equal protection as the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments assert and grant. It was also a purchase, a condition of cash flow and privilege of patrilineage. Guess whose fathers, grandfathers, weren't eligible to vote prior to 1870? recently emancipated, formerly enslaved black people. That's who. Now this went on for decades and throughout the entire nation. In fact, Michigan itself, Michigan, this pleasant peninsula, didn't abolish its poll taxes despite having fought for the union during the Civil War until 1915. In other northern states, until as late as the 30s, and in parts of the South well into the 1960s. And poll taxes weren't considered unconstitutional for federal elections until 1964, when the 24th Amendment was ratified, a year before the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now let me remind you that the, this body, that the 24th Amendment is specifically about federal elections, but a year after the Voting Rights Act, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in Harper v. Virginia Board of Electors that under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, states could not levy a poll tax as a prerequisite for voting in state and local elections. Let me repeat that so that it's heard. Under the Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment, states couldn't levy a poll tax as a prerequisite for voting in state and local elections. This bill, Senate Bill 285, which allows that a voter who chooses to vote by absentee ballot to also have the option to submit a photocopy of their government issue ID with their ballot, makes it such that if that specific voter chooses that option, they must incur an additional cost in order to cast their ballot. Remember, having to pay a fee, no matter how nominal or optional, in order to vote is constitutionally prohibited. It costs additional money to make the photocopy, and that is a fee. If you have your own printer and ink and cartridges and paper that cost you money, it is a fee. In the nutshell, creating an additional financial requirement of voters, even an optional one, in order to cast one's ballot is essentially a poll tax and would be an unconstitutional resurrection of Jim Crow who should remain dead and buried. 
As I said earlier, the alternate methods in Senate Bill 285 for proof of his identity as an absentee voter do not make up, compensate, or otherwise negate or mollify the fact that within this very piece of legislation is language enshrining into law the ability to allow a poll tax. And permitting a poll tax in any form, optional or not, is in direct violation of both the 14th and 24th Amendments of the Constitution of these United States. And just because the legislation doesn't explicitly name the option for a voter to provide that photocopy with their, one, with their government issued ID in order to secure an absentee ballot, with a penalization on top of that, of being provided a provisional absentee ballot that's not counted on election day, that doesn't make that option not fail to be a full poll tax when it serves the same or similar function. Now yesterday, we all participated in a ceremony honoring those who upheld, protected, and defended the Constitution from enemies both foreign and domestic, and who paid the ultimate price and sacrifice in doing so. 29 months ago, we took oaths to uphold the Constitution, but here we are on the precipice of voting on a piece of legislation that is counter to both democracy and the Constitution. And if this body passes this bill, this body cements itself as being willing to be a domestic as enemy of the Constitution. I prefer not to be an enemy of the Constitution or of democracy. And for that reason, I will be voting no, and I urge others to join me in rebuking and denouncing this unconstitutional summoning of Jim Crow, and in doing so, to uphold, protect, and defend the Constitution and democracy. Thank you.